Good evening, friends. Uh, very warm welcome to CSDS and to the 24th Bien Gangli Memorial Lecture. Our distinguished guest this evening is Professor Isabel Hoffmeyer, and the meeting is being chaired by my friend and colleague, Professor Ravi Sundram, who will also introduce the speaker. So before I hand over proceedings to Professor Sundram, a few words about the lecture series. Uh, these lectures are held in the memory of Professor Bien Gangli, former chairman, CSDS Board of Governors. Professor Kangli was a distinguished economist, interested in all aspects of the human condition and deeply committed to promoting the life of the mind. Earlier speakers in the series include, among others, Professor Charles Taylor, Viku Parekh, Roboto Junger, Michael Walzer, Georgia Agamben, Bina Agarwal, Partha Chatterjee, Dipesh Chakrabarti, Leela Gandhi, Leela Bulgoth, Francesca Orsini, and last year, Professor John Kinayer. It is a marker of our times, perhaps, that today we move beyond considerations of the human life alone to a discussion on the biosphere and planetary life. And we could not have found a better speaker to address us about the challenges of the Anthropocene than Professor Isabel Hoffmeyer. So very warm welcome to you, Professor Hoffmeyer. And with that, Professor Sundram, if you could introduce our speaker and take forward the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deepu. Uh, so there are many reasons we decided to uh, invite Professor Hoffmeyer for the Ganguly Lecture. We like her work, that's the first. We really like her work. But I think very crucially, her scholarship sets up very productive connections to ongoing interests at CSDS. What, what are these interests? These include conceptual histories of colonialism and post-colonialism, science and atmospheres, media and environment. So her lecture today, uh, Books in the Biosphere, Print Culture in the Anthropocene, I think speaks to many of these questions. So first I'll do the easy part, which is a short expansion of Isabel's biography, which is very impressive. And then I'll very briefly set up a kind of intellectual context for today. So Isabel Hoffmeyer is Professor Emerita at the University of Witwatersrand. She is, was global professor at NYU from 2013 to 2022. Isabel is a leading scholar of the Indian Ocean world and most recently of the whole field of oceanic humanities, which she her work really speaks to. Her works include the fantastic book, which I enjoyed, Gandhi's Printing Press, Experiments in Slow Reading, 10 Books That Shaped the British Empire, and most recently, most recently, Dockside Reading, Hydrocolonialism, and the Custom House. So I'm going to use my encounter with Dockside Reading to set up some of the issues today. So decades ago, the scholar Michael Serres famously complained about the intellectual limits of theories of sensation at that time. So Serres says, and I quote, lots of phenomenology, no sensation, everything via language, unquote. Today, that world seems beyond us. The symbolic and the representational have long lost hegemonic authority in recent scholarship. We see the anthropological attention to interspecies connections and conflicts, atmospheres and toxic air. Deepu, who spoke before you, has his book on this. But most remarkably, there's a radical conceptual expansion. What is this expansion? Pipes can be documents, writes Brian Larkin. The sensory and the medial shape the environment in powerful, ongoing ways. And I think the plasticity of this dynamic is important. The plasticity is important. Matter, what we call matter, is perhaps always in formation, moving, shift shaping, exploding. Isabel's recent dockside reading follows very productively the sensory political an agentive power of water across literary texts. So the dock, from where she's setting the stage of this book, the dock acts as a hub of circulation, staging a conversation between environmental media and the oceanic humanities. Air and water don't just transmit information. Materials record time and transfigure the world as we know it. There are also, I think, polyvalent connections and periodic the repurposing of objects in the port and the world. 
the boundaries blur. Isabel, Isabel's work references conceptually the oceanic studies, new materialisms, hydrocolonialisms, black hydropoetics, it's a really powerful uh, expansion, and atmospheric methods. I think the crucial shift in recent years has been in the scholarship from the Global South. And I think the shift is the careful ethnographic and historical attention to the field. This goes crucially, it goes beyond the bibliographic intensities and the vitalist excitements of the first wave of new materialism and post-humanist debates and the first wave emerged from the Western Academy. I think contemporary engagements may suggest sharper breaks and divergences, cuts in the vitalities of matter, sudden cuts in the vitalities of matter. In the framework of the colony, we need to consider vast inequalities, the routine enchantments of violence, which we are privy to, the epidemiological and racial anxieties when managing migrations of colonized bodies, organisms, microbes. Equally, equally, we need to be attentive to new capacities, astonishing breaks, and transfigurations. So the entire Western tradition, from Aristotle to Kant, from Aryan to Habermas, is based on the assumption that the political is an activity defined by speech and interpretation. In this model, in this model, which we have grown up with, discursive speech defines citizenship. It makes who you are. Dockside reading shifts capacities typically associated with human autopoiesis to a larger landscape involving other than human interventions, objects, objects enter new circuits of value and connection. I think Isabel's work for me asks crucial questions. Who is a reader? What is reading? What is a text? A dockside reading realigns expressive encounters via the relationship between objects, relations, trade routes, and colonial violence. So it's a very audacious, I think, reworking of a site. It's a site, it's a port, but it's not just a port. So you have this port setting with this with all the routine epidemiological and ecological dangers where books cohabit with insects and fluids, carriage, and she really expands on this. Please read the book. Carriage includes bodies and very mundane commodities. And she writes, and I quote, customs officials functioned as a species of dockside ontologist, decreeing what an object is. This is what customs officials, what is an object, right? Although they more than anyone else were aware of the contingencies of such descriptions, unquote. So this is a literary and cultural space. It's proprioceptive, it's ambient, it's productive. So you have these officials who are trying to hold things, designate things. It's full of surprises, semiotically charged with the atmospherics of connection. So there are perplexing challenges of classification. There are customs officials, classif the perplexing challenges of classification when objects crowd and contaminate each other. It's an astonishing intellectual mise-en-scene. And this, friends, is no better way for me to make way for the 24th Ganguly Memorial Speaker, Isabel Hoffman. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, and firstly, my very warmest thanks to CSDS for the enormous honor of this invitation. Um, it's a, a really one of the highlights of my career, uh, you know, to have been invited. Particular thanks to Ravi Sund uh, Sundaram and Preeti Nambiar, who have given me very patient assistance over several months. Um, thank you, everybody here for coming and for the people joining us online. As I say again, I can't emphasize again what a pleasure and an honor it is to be here. Okay, let me begin in a rather unusual place. A few weeks back, I did something I never expected to do. I held an art exhibition. Let's wait, we're just waiting for a slide. There we are. Okay, so this was the, 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 the invitation to the art exhibition, and it was a double bill. There was the exhibition itself, 
And then there was a celebration, um, and if you could have the next slide, of a wonderful fest shift called Reading for the South that two very dear colleagues, Sarah Nuttall and Sean Lavery, um, had edited on my retirement, or rather semi-retirement. So creative practice and research had informed each other, and so the artwork had been paired with this book on my scholarship. So as regards the latter, the core of my research has long been focused on studies of print culture and book history. One part of the exhibition drew fairly obviously on this work and explored the use of books as mark-making implements. Like, many, like all academics, I have far too many books, so a while back I began experimenting with a few of these excess volumes. The method I used was to immerse the, the volume uh, in water, as you can see, and then once it's saturated, the book becomes malleable and can be fashioned into interesting shapes, as you can see. Um, and then the next one, uh, you then can cover, you know, cover the top or the bottom with any paint you like and use that as a stamp. You can, there's, there's the method. And then onto the next one, and that's the sort of effect that you get. Okay. So the, now the second part of the in, in, uh, exhibition involved a technique variously called eco-printing, botanical printing, or printing with botanicals. So very briefly, one takes plant matter and some sort of substrate, I use paper and fabric, you roll them up very tightly and you boil or steam them and the heat then transfers the pigment of the leaf onto the substrate. So you can see one there. The title, in fact, of the exhibition was Gasp, and from this process, um, uh, and it comes from this process, as the, the leaf really under the heat gives up its last vital juice, and it creates, creates a kind of halo or gasp um, around the stem, and the next one as well. Um, and let me, to, 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 just to give you a sense of this technique, uh, let me just show you first a work on paper. So that was one of the works on paper. Um, I'll show you two. This is a detail from that picture um, then, and also another detail from the picture. And then the next one, that's the exhibition itself and gives you a sense of some of the uh, works on fabric. So as regards the eco-printing part of the exhibition, the link to books was perhaps less obvious and came via concern with human-induced climate change. Like others in the humanities, I've been grappling with how to make my academic concerns speak to these precipitously changing circumstances. For those like me who study print culture, the challenge is quite daunting. How does one put together the dry technology of the book with the growing floods and storms of the Anthropocene? One answer that I've been exploring is to take books outside, so to relocate books in this sort of massive ecosystem of plants, animals, minerals, water, soil, and air, or what I call here books in the biosphere. So in thinking about books in the air and atmosphere, I had started a project on insects in archives, which led me to think more about plants, and as I'll explain in more detail, um, of books as a type of failed plant. So this interest in plants in turn led to eco-printing as a way of learning about the plant world um, through creative practice. So I start with the description of this exhibition as that it enacts in miniature the concerns of this lecture on resituating studies of print culture in the age of the Anthropocene. In the first method, books are literally taken outside and are immersed in water. In the second, plant matter is brought inside to produce monoprints. While perhaps rather prosaically literal, these processes you know, plunge books into the elements um, outside while bringing leaves inside to act as a form of inscription. So inside and outside are somewhat con reconfigured. So much discussion of books and reading you know, implicitly in assumes a dry and an inside setting. So in dockside reading, um, oh, sorry, this was another one of the fabric ones. Can we have the next one? Okay, in dockside reading, um, I started to explore books, as Ravi was saying, not in the library, but on the dockside. And as printed matter entered the colonial port, it was checked by customs officials to see that it was not pirated, seditious, or obscene. So these, the customs house was hence 
uh, the section of the uh, colonial estate that established protocols on copyright and customs officials were the first censors. So customs officials also deployed the ocean as a mode of censorship with undesirable books often being turfed into the ocean. These then was, were, was one of the many instances of what I termed hydro-colonialism, and I explored how the meaning of books and print culture was shaped by these protocols as they moved through the port. So dockside reading, again, as Ravi was saying, is an attempt really to try and bring together book history and environmental humanities. Um, it's, it's by no means the first to do so, and there is now a burgeoning uh, field uh, taking shape at this intersection. So scholars investigate, for example, the ecological foot footprint of book production, the changing nature of preservation and archives in the Anthropocene, where permanent supplies of electricity and air conditioning can no longer be assured. Other themes include printed books becoming waste and entering landfills in the digital age. And these themes intersect, of course, with a growing and powerful scholarship on the environmental entanglements of digital media itself. So Joshua Calhoun, an early modernist, ex explores papermaking and the organic nature of the page, asking how has human communication been altered by the corruptibility of the non-human matter used to make texts? So as uh, Calhoun indicates, modern readers and, and scholars in particular seldom recognize the plants, animals, and minerals in their media. Thanks, of course, to chemicals, electricity, and air conditioning that keeps documents in a state of, sus uh, of suspended decay. Now, these debates in turn form part of a wider, of course, elemental turn across media and cultural studies, providing in Melody Jew's word an expanded environmental sense of the media concept. The different of elements is, of course, broad and can now take in literally any type of matter. And well-known examples include studies of salt, seaweed, submarine cables, ice, air, atmosphere, and so on, that are examined broadly as media that record, store, and transmit information. While not using these exact rubrics, much post-colonial scholarship has long considered elemental questions as central. Obvious examples include water in the undersea as forms mediating memories of the Middle Passage, the land as a medium of anti-colonial thought, fire and flood as millenarian instruments of renewal, and so on. So whether in you know black hydropoetics, aqua, aqua, aqua futurism, you know, riffing on Afrofuturism, speculative uh, multi-species fictions, wake work, elemental themes have become a major focus, you know, for post-colonial and decolonial scholarship. So this lecture then is a set of explorations of books in the biospheres, okay, the term of denoting you know, the zone of life on earth, the life saturated envelope of the earth, a matrix of interactions of land, ocean, air, and cosmic energy. The phrase may of course sound more like hubris than a description of actual method. Um, and there is also the question of why this term when there are many other terms one could use, earth systems, critical zone, Gaia, and so on and so on. However, I invoke it here for two reasons. Firstly, I think it's a useful mechanism, you know, the scale of it for radically relativizing the book. As a supposed instrument of rationality, the book has long been sequestered with the human and has been defined in opposition to the environment. Inserting it into the biosphere with all its, of its you know, infinite dimensions undoes some of that separation and resituates the book. Secondly, I invoke the biosphere to bring its outer limits into the conversation. There is often a perception that areas like the seabed, the stratosphere, or the poles are beyond human reach. It is, for example, not unusual to hear the claim that the moon has been more studied than the seabed, an assertion that positions the benthos as some very remote frontier. That the sea, yet the seabed, of course, is littered with millions of shipwrecks, human and non-human bones, and a confetti of microplastics. I experienced this idea of supposed, you know, the supposed remote frontier when I visit, visited Antarctica in 2019. On my return, people greeted me as though I had been to the moon and simply could not see enough images or hear enough stories of my experiences. Um, and this is the group I went with. It was me, a philosopher, a literary colleague, and a novelist. Um, 
and Arthur, and Arthur, of course, is hardly remote. At least we were in that year, at least um, one four of 50,000 tourists who go there annually. Okay, so after that introduction, let me turn then to offer these two small case studies, one on insects and archives, and then plants, prints, and African healers. The first slightly longer and I think more developed than the second. Okay, the setting then for our first is um, South Africa in sort of in the early 20th century, you know, on the cusp of becoming what is South Africa, and the setting is mostly Cape Town. Okay. So the intray of the government entomologist not infrequently resembled an insectarium. Exasperated gardeners and worried householders posted bugs dead and alive in envelopes, tins, matchboxes, and bottles, seeking remedies for their ruined carnations and vermiculated floors. One morning in February 1910 in Cape Town, two flasks of insects arrived, dispatched by the Attorney General's office, where they had been discovered in the records of the Registrar of Deeds. The state entomologist Charles Lunesbury was quick to recognize the creature as the paste beetle, or more, more properly, Cytodrepa panaceum, today apparently Stegobium panaceum. Their, quote, ravages in stalls, volumes of records were well known to Lunesbury and, quote, have been the theme of many memoranda from this office during the past 14 years. So over those 14 years and before, an array of arthropods in both their larval and adult form had taken up residence in collections of government documents and the shelves that housed them. These included furniture uh, beetles, biscuit beetles, paste beetles, fish moths, cockroaches, white ants, book lice, and weevils, known collectively and misleadingly as bookworms. These creatures had in turn been assailed by a range of chemicals in powder, aerosol, liquid, and gaseous form corrosive sublimate, carbon bisulfide, sulfuric acid, methyl bromide, cyanide of potassium, hydrocyanic acid, paraffin oil, naphthalene, and so on and so on. These fumigations, spraying, and sprinklings had met with mixed success, and reports of insects, plus the insects themselves, continue to make their way to the entree of the government entomologist. While miniature in scale, these intersections of insect paper and chemicals have has prompted scholars to explore larger themes. Through following the trail of white ants, Rohan de Broy has discussed the entomopolitics of the imperial state. Other researchers have traced the chemical legacies in museum and archi archival collections and their implication for the restitution of objects. Related themes include the imperial formation of entomology, largely shaped in the tropics, and the intertwined histories of war, insecticide, and genocide. Print culture and book history suggest further productive ang angles, especially as regards the ecology of texts. Can we, as Calhoun urges, recognize the plants, animals, and minerals in our media? The case of the paste beetle very obviously draws attention to the non-human matter in texts and processes of decay. So leather and cloth binding, starch paste, animal glues, cellulose-based paper and cardboard and mold, all offered opportunities for larval and in some case, in cases adult feeding of stack pests. Archivists had to scrutinize their volumes, attending to different kinds of bindings and paper with reports from the Antilles and Calcutta indicating that, quote, the cosmopolitan book maggot favored red bindings and chose French paper over English. These latter discussions cohered under the rubric of books in the tropics, where enemies of the codex were deemed to be plentiful. A self-appointed custodian of the book, the colonial state was ever keen to defend its volumes against such enemies. In 1920, the government printers of Uganda produced an official handbook which carried a slip indicating that the solution used for binding would, quote, render the work impervious to the ravages of insects. In similar vein, the Bureau of Printing for the Government of the Philippines exper experimented with different poisonous glues and bindings and then inserted printed slips into their publication asking users to write back, you know, provided they st were still alive, uh, reporting on the condition of the binding and the state of the book generally. So we tend to think of books as reasonably resilient object, objects, but in the tropics, the, the, the codex became a vulnerable object that required chemical armor to survive. 
In 1869, uh, German book manufacturers recommended that volumes, quote, exported to the tropics should be protected from insect attack by the application of alum and corrosive sublimate and a shirting or sort of book binding gauze should be applied to the still wet poison lacquer. So in the tropics, the orga organic substrate of the book came to the fore and, and as we shall see, supported a number of unusual and unexpected definitions of the book. In setting out the story, um, I'll look briefly at insects and archives and then examine the archivists and state responses to them. So insects and archives. Um, let me just have some water. While the insect community in any archive was varied, one could always be assured of finding members of the family Anobidae, okay, borers, who went by a range of colloquial names in different parts of the world, biscuit beetle, drugstore beetle, tobacco beetle, bread beetle, and in the Cape archives, paste beetle. As these names suggest, these food opportunists have been inhabiting human provisions for millennia and today are generally discussed under the category of stored product insects. Following this logic, we might refer to them as stored book insects, a niche they have been occupying ever since codexes, manuscripts, books and paper have been around. Stored books offers an ideal habitat for borers. You know, concentrations of cellulose and protein in a dark, quiet, and in some instances, temperature-controlled environment, largely free of predators. Most bookworms probably arrived through already inhabited volumes, although some must have located their own biblio habitats using skills of sort of semiochemical detection and color recognition, possibly explaining the often noted popularity of red bindings. Adult females, you know, de de deposit eggs on or in the volumes, and the paper-eating larvae then burrow minute tunnels into the volume, producing that tiny shot hole effect that one often encounters in old books. Under ideal temperature and humidity conditions, the larvae spend one or two months in their books before pupating, after which the adults emerge. They have a lifespan of, one, of about two to three weeks, and the adults then fly uh, to the next suitable volume before eggs are again oviposited. So as Emma Solberg, in, a medievalist in her wonderful article, Human and Insect Bookworms, indicates, bibliovores treated books rather like habitats akin to a log, borrowing, uh, burrowing the outer perimeters. Conveniently for us, she says, bookworms prefer the exterior and the edges of books to the interior or the center. They tend to make their tunnels, holes, and burrows in the covers, gutters, and margins. Yet in treating books like plants, insects must have considered them as rather sad specimens of vegetation, unable to produce any of their own defenses. Most plants and trees have a range of protective mechanisms against herbivorous insects, or at least those with which they have co-evolved. You know, these include alarm chemicals that alert, alert other plants to dangers, or can attract predators of the insects, compounds which disrupt insects' metabolism, mechanical adaptations like closing on touch, which would dislodge the bug, resin to, for up, to force out borers, and so on. So without any of, these, uh, any of these mechanisms, books must have resembled failed plants, a concentration of cellulose quite unable to defend itself in any way. So this physical presence of insects was not the only mode, though, in which insects occupied um, archives. A goodly percentage of the files of the entomology department are arranged around particular species so that the insect itself shape, shapes bureaucratic procedures. Files also contain there are a lot of drawings, and the next one, and photographs. Since many, and you know, also then the prophylactic strategies you know, like naphthalene, creosote, et cetera, you know, are strongly centered and would remind users of the presence of insects as with the closure of archives for fumigation. Okay, so let's look then at state and archivist responses. So chemical fumigation in the Cape archives arrived at more or less the same time as its use in two other locales. Firstly, orchards and vineyards, and secondly, Cape Town Harbor. So like pesticides in many parts of the world, those on, on the fruit trees and vines of the Western Cape were the product of US expertise and experiment. Leading the local charge, charge was Charles Lunesbury, the first government entomologist 
appointed in 1895, a 23-year-old fresh out of Amherst Agricultural College and Experimental Station. Like his mentors, Lunesbury was a great proponent of pesticides, seeing them as a necessary technology that could make agriculture in South Africa modern. The second site, Cape Town Harbour, like most imperial ports, had been carrying out sulfuric fumigation of ships since the 1880s, and in 1895 extended fumigation to the dockside and adding a plant fumigator and then a steam disinfector. So as with many life forms in the Cape Colony, the fate of the insects in the archives was shaped by capitalist agriculture on the one hand and colonial maritime border making on the other. There are of course myriad other factors one could list, but for the moment, let's stick with these two since it was the state departments associated with them which advised the archives on how to address their insect problem. The first and most frequently called upon was the entomological division. The second, the Immigration Department, which along with the Port Health Authorities oversaw fumigation. The ways in which insects then encountered chemicals in the archives were hence offshoots of the fumigation practices and protocols of these two divisions. So Lunesbury's department, uh, in, you know, in keeping with the ideas of the time, defined its missions as e economic entomology, with a major focus on injurious insects that affected those plants and crops um, of, uh, you know, of particular interests uh, to human uh, settlers. The recommendation that entomologists made to archivists were informed by their experience of dealing with insect infestations in plants and stored goods. So in proposing the use of um, um, methyl bromide in archives, a report probably from the 1920s spoke only of its effectiveness in relation to eradicating insects on plants and in stored foods, not on paper or archive settings. So after noting the chemicals, quote, properties of penetration, which make possible the destruction of certain sheltered pests, such as leaf miners, borers, mites, and other internal feeders, the report praises the ability of methyl bromide to disinfest quarantined produce and plants, whether these were imported Christmas trees, narcissus bulbs, green coffee beans, or dehydrated soup. So a section plant reactions indicates that in general, living plant material is unaffected by ordinary doses of methyl bromide. So how, how paper might react to this compound was never broached, although some archivists did point out that these remedies, in fact, adversely affected paper and inked. Most archivists, however, deferred to the entomologists following their advice, or that which came from the Museum Herbarium, in any event, you know, advised by the entomologists. The Q Herbarium was also a respected authority. Uh, and in the 1940s, archival documents were fumigated at the entomological and plant quarantine station uh, in Cape Town, a practice that for, further then reinforced the link of document and plant. For entomologists, the archivists were subsumed into the logic of insect control in plants. You know, archives then were implicitly a species of herbarium, their documents and volumes like so many closely packed leaves. Whereas the entomologists saw the archives as a type of monocrop in need of pesticide, the immigration department approached the problem from the framework of contaminated ships and cargo. From this perspective, the insects may have seemed like miniature rats running riot, the volumes like infested blankets or secondhand clothing in need of disinfection. The port authorities had long seen books as slightly suspect objects, containers of dangerous foreign ideas, and vectors of contamination, intellectual rather than bacterial, but contaminants nonetheless. Left to their, his own devices, the chief immigration op officer would probably have ordered the infected archival volumes burned in the destructor as furnaces were known. So schooled in maritime fumigation, immigration officers were wedded to sulfuric forms of disinfection for ships, steam disinfection for cargo and luggage, and as indicated when all else fails, disposal in the, in, in the destructor. So these techniques obviously did not well map well onto the archives. And when consulted for advice, immigration officials were generally at a loss and sought guidance from the public works departments. 
The shaky purchase on the situation emerges from a letter sent by the chief immigration officer to the public work department asking what drugs would be required for fumigation. So this hand-handedness was further augmented by international shifts in fumigation technology. Since the 1880s, maritime fumigation techniques had been sulfur-based, but from the early 1900s, cyanide-based methods gained the upper hand. First used in the Californian citrus industry in the 1880s, these latter systems involved derivatives of hydrocyanic gas and were actively promoted by Loonsbury. As these methods took hold, a variety of commercial applications of hydrocyanic gas as a pesticide were developed, most, most notoriously Zyklon B, which was to become the genocidal instrument of the Nazi regime. So patented in Germany in 1923, the compound was actively marketed as a pesticide in several regions of the world, including South Africa, where it was in fact used until the 1950s. The German company De Gesch, which held the patent for Zyklon B, had acquired a controlling interest in the Durban-based South African fumigation company um, until the company was in fact seized as enemy property with the advent of World War II. And just um, this is the sort of publicity material from the South African fumigation company. And then the next one, it's quite an interesting, it's in Durban. So the danger instructions are in English, Afrikaans, Zulu, and Tamil. Uh, okay. Okay, that brings me at the end to uh, insects in archives, and let me then move on to um, uh, plants, prints, and African healers. And let me start again with two um, archival images that both contain plants. Okay, so the first one, as you can see, is, is an envelope which quite literally contains a plant, or at least part of a plant and was forwarded in 1906 by a Cape farmer to the Department of Agriculture. The plant was poisoning the farmer's livestock and the letter requests identification of the specimen and its pharmacological actions, okay? The second one is an is a Sizulu pamphlet advertising the muti or African medicines of Mafavuke Ngobe, a licensed herbalist or Nyanga, and just the next, those terms will come up, so just for ease of reference, that's uh, how they're spelt. Um, on to the next one. Okay, there you can see on the top left is an, an image of Idanga Bane, um, which is Comelina Africana, uh, which looks like that. Um, it's an ex important medicinal plant uh, to which Nobo likens himself. He urges readers to write to him and visit him in person, and then lists a very long uh, you know, number of remedies he has on offer. It's a four-page, very closely uh, you know, typed pamphlet. The pamphlet featured in a trial, of which more later, and as part of those proceedings was translated, and that is the translation that, that I've mainly relied on. At first glance, these two documents may appear as straightforward opposites. In the first, the plants is, on, is literally on His Majesty's service, an object of empire about to be analyzed and identified by a departmental official in the interests of creating more effective colonial animal husbandry. Uh, the second speaks of indigenous knowledge systems of plant medicine and hence appears to offer understandings entirely at odds with the imperial notion of authority and science. However, if we look more closely at the pamphlet, the stark, stark binary um, starts to break down. Okay, so Ngobo identifies himself both with the Idanga Bane while also presenting himself, and I don't know if you can read it there, as a native medical scientist un under his name. So the pamphlet urges readers to write to him with mail orders and to visit him. And... Um, as I said, these remedies are very densely packed in the pamphlet, uh, creating a kind of, if you like, a vertical print equivalent of a horizontal display of medicines in a pharmacy shop. And if I could just show the next one. We don't have any images of Norbal, but there is a film that has been made um, about him, you know, and, and particularly the trial, it's made in Sweden, so it's not available in South Africa, so I haven't actually seen it. 
but this would give you a sense then of that you know display um, in in his uh, medicine shop. So as regards the imperial on his majesty's service envelope, we don't know its fate and whether it was successfully analyzed. From other sources, however, we do know that when it came to poison, indigenous plants confounded government specialists. When required to form autopsies on bodies assumed to have been murdered by means of plant poison, analysts were at a loss. As one official noted, in European countries and among white communities in this country, the poison used would be one more or less known to science, but in the native territories of South Africa, the case is altogether different. With our native herbal poisons, one has but seldom anything to found an opinion upon. In applying the test, certain chemical reactions may be noticed, but that brings the matter no further. In these two examples, then, the relationship of science and traditional knowledge are not what, exactly what we might expect. In one case, indigenous herbal poisons confound colonial science, and in the other, a purveyor of traditional remedies adds biomedical science to his therapeutic portfolio. So both instances then configure plants and power through the medium of print, but in somewhat unexpected ways. As such, they feed into scholarship on plant and print, which have long been associated, you know, materially, metaphorically, linguistically, and conceptually. As Leah Knight, an early modern scholar notes, verbals and herbals have long been entwined, whether through flax in paper, covers made from wood, gall in ink, or reeds for pen. Parts of the book, like leaves and sheaves, were named for the plant world, while printed volumes were likened to gardens and vice versa, both sites of collection, you know, whether of text or of plant. So the relationship then of plants, print, and European empires has, of course, been, you know, quite extensively explored, whether through studies of illustrated botanical and horticultural handbooks, herbariums, botanical gardens, exhibitions of flower shows, and obviously, you know, thinking about plantations and agriculture. As settler colonialism took hold in the 19th century, plant matter became entangled with colonial maritime border making. As Jini Shinizuka shows in Biotic Borders, ideas of invasive spe species and biological nativism became entangled with discourses on human uh, immigration, who was alien, who belonged, and who could be, who could or couldn't be assimilated. These biotic orders in turn subjected plants to regimes of documentation, you know, whether um, this sort of thing, you know, fumigation certificates, customs clearances, insurance, and print then obviously was, you know, a minor but important medium, you know, for in enabling this extensive circulation of plants. So whether through the image making machines of empire, you know, the flower shows, exhibitions and so on, or through the bureaucratic protocols governing movement in and across imperial state place, plants were yoked to print that aimed to make them legible uh, by framing them in imperial, colonial and scientific frameworks. Although of course, as we can see, um, this, you know, these often failed. Um, a less studied aspect of plant print and empire pertains to the world of African herbalists and healers and the fairly very extensive print culture that they produced, of which uh, Norbo's pamphlet is one example. So one really good route into this topic is an excellent book by Corin Flint, Healing Traditions, African Medicine, Cultural Exchange and Competition in South Africa, 1820 to 1948. So focused largely on Durban, the book in fact opens in fact with Norbo himself, who by the 1930s, had established something of a, a, a sort of medical empire compressed, comprising a mail order business as well as five shops. And as Flint notes, his remedies controlled, uh, included local herbs, some in Indian remedies of which more later, chemist drugs and patent medicines. Needless to say, Norbo's success and others like him alarmed the white biomedical community, regarded him and his associates as a serious source of competition. Not only did African Inyangas uh, attract white clientele, especially in areas where, do where doctors were scarce, but there was also considerable competition between African healers, white doctors, and pharmacists for African customers. Overall, the su success of outfits like Norbos challenged the authority of white biomedicine. 
These doctors and pharmacists responded by creating racialized forms of medical authority, which sought to eliminate competition from African he healers, legally preventing them from using quote unquote white medicine and restricting their practice to a narrowly defined idea of African traditional medicine. These themes were sharply enacted in 1940 when Norval was charged with carrying on the business of a chemist or druggist for which he was not licensed. The prosecution sought to, to draw a very stark distinction between African and European medicine. Yet as Flint shows, even their own witnesses could not maintain this dis distinction since they attested to the fact that African herbalists, for example, routinely used exotic plants like jalap from South America or uh, male fern from Europe and uh, North America. And some indigenous plants such as croton seeds uh, were marked as exotic and as coming from India. As his defense argued, Normal and his associates practiced a, a, dyna a dynamic form of medicine that drew on a range of sources, including, including Indian therapeutics. As Flint, Flint demonstrates, African and Indian practitioners influenced each other. Indian healers acquired extensive uh, herbal law, often from living amongst uh, you know, close to or in African communities or from African practitioners, and in some instances consciously fashioned themselves as Indian Nyangas, uh, combining uh, Indian and African medical law. African Nyangas likewise included Indian herbs, uh, medicinal spice, and religious uh, powders in their practice. And Flint reports that Tulsi, in fact, became a Zulu word. So in a multi-therapeutic environment, Novo and his colleagues experimented with a range of resources and techniques. Their pamphlets form, formed, formed part of this assemblage, drawing together dry, diverse traditions in one place. The use of Idangabane as an emblem points to healing practices that assumed a chain of relationships and interactions. So the healing practice involved, for example, dreams, ancestral messages, plants, ochres, animal product, products, patient, and healer. The medicine did not work alone, okay, and was a member of a team in which the work of healing was distributed across a number of agents, including the pamphlet, which of course now joins this assemblage. In an anonymous urban environment where one could no longer necessarily have a personal relationship with the healer or know where the plants had come from, the pamphlet was a trusty intermediary that carried the power of the network of which it formed a part. Yet as, po as part of a mail order business, the pamphlet participates equally in a market and as noted, you know, mimics the arrangement of a commercial muti shop um, or medicine shop, lining up a series of remedies which the customers can choose. Um, and this is, it's, it's a contemporary picture, but it's a, a, a muti shop of an Indian Nyanga outside Durban. Um, uh, while in some instances, you know, herbal uh, ingredients for medicine were sold on the street, as you can see here, uh, you know, um, muti shops were popular since they appeal to African ideas of chlonipa or respect, you know, for these very important substances. Um, and and that's, that should more properly be, you know, respectfully housed than on the street. So this is um, the House of Medicines. Um, and it belonged to uh, a, a con contemporary and colleague of Norbo and would have been very similar to the kind of shops that Norbo had. So the, the pamphlet also then carries out, if you like, the similar function, um, providing an appropriate and respectful framing for the remedies. Um, and the Pamphlet also then embodies very much a portfolio approach to health in which one, in which one can e keep adding you know, therapeutic options one after the other. Uh, okay, and as studies, many studies in other parts of the world indicate, print always invents or reinvents herbal medicines in urban settings and popular medical advertising takes shape at the intersection of urbanization, print and medical markets. Norbo's pamphlet undertakes similar work, uh, but in a constrained environment of white bi biomedical control and enforced traditionalism. The pamphlet nonetheless exceeds these frameworks configuring the therapeutic agency of plants in a dynamic configuration of different traditions. Okay, 
let me move then towards some general conclusions. Um, what larger issues you know, arise then from relocating the book as an elemental medium amongst other elemental media, uh, in this case, you know, insect media and plant media? In the case of the former insect media, we have explored how you know, small scale networks apparent in books and archival documents are used then to visualize human scale networks whether you know, of colonial war against an enemy or an opportunity to demonstrate the power of the chemical empire against its smallest subjects, a kind of spectacle of genocide in miniature. So insect media also play a role in producing unusual definitions of the book. And as we've seen, insect, insects and entomologists shared an understanding of books and printed matter as failed plants, you know, un unable to protect themselves and hence then having to be saved by the chemical formulas of the entomology department. This work of insects and book raises further questions about reading text and indeed the archive itself. Emma Solberg raises the question of reading and she says, she, uh, she talks about wormholes in uh, man manuscripts and she says, wormholes in short have been understood as damage as that which gets in the way of reading not as something to be read. So she suggests including wormholes really, you know, as part of the text, positioning insect, insects then as co-writers and readers with humans. Yet one can't help wondering whether this rather benign view in fact arises from the excellent preservation conditions of wealthy libraries and archives in the global north, where superb storage conditions, permanent electricity, and plentiful resources enable damage to be kept to a minimum. As we all know, these are not the conditions prevailing in archives in the global south. How then do we read, can, can we read post-colonial wormholes, assuming, of course, that one can even get access to the document in the first instance? In part, of course, this question forms part of a long-standing post-colonial de debate on reading in and for damage. One route into this takes us, as I say, onto plants um, and the idea of the ruderal, okay? Namely, so it's a definition of a plant able to grow on waste or disturbed ground or rubbish. And it's a con concept I take from Radhika Subramaniam's lovely article called, called Notes for a CD Politics. So the plant that Norbo adopted in his pamphlet, Comalina Africana, is such a ruderal plant, often considered almost something of a weed. And as a footnote, I understand it is related to Com uh, Comalina bengalensis, the Bengal dayflower. I don't know if this is known. Uh, also a hardy ruderal. So Comalina Africana or, or Idangabane offered metaphorical and material sources for Norbo's project. It's a plant person and indeed printed pamphlet, um, you know, taking root in disturbed and adverse circumstances. In this instance, then, there is a transposition between the potentialities of plant, media, person, and print. This talk has drawn together, then, insects, plants, and prints as intersecting forms of media that re can resituate existing conceptualizations of the book as a dry and purely textual object. To return to Calhoun, I hope to have shown you that there is good reason to pay close attention to the plants, animals, and minerals in our media. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's well, that was incredible. Uh, it was incredible in two ways. Uh, it, in a sense, uh, it's a new field that you're opening up. It's uh, it's it's something that you did in 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 the previous talks I reading, and you're also carrying over uh, elements. So what I liked, I'll tell you what I liked, the way you started. You open as you described what the custom inspectors are doing with the book is they're trying to demediate the book 
even as the book asserts a kind of you know it's 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 literally it, it's symbolic value you know it's tension it's, it's, it's all tension here uh, the book is kind of a kind of a dead plant uh, <laughs> a book is a dead plant uh, which uh, transacts with uh, mono, you know, an insect is engagement with the book as a kind of media res, which is kind of monoculture. So I like, you know, you're throwing away, throwing out concepts. I suspect that in the book, these yes. will be fleshed out. And then you're moving into a kind of archaeology of medicine, uh, which move between the colonial, uh, you know, uh, colonial uh, classification and, and all these indigenous practices. Uh, which are also using non quote unquote non indigenous transmission mm -hmm. methods, the pamphlet, for example, vis a vis the prescription, right? So I, I wanted to, I wanted you to. This is my first opening point. If you bring back this notion of demediation, uh, where does print as a form of transmission work with the practice of medicine? Because the prescription. And the uh, back end classification model is seen to standardize Western medicine, the whole taxonomy, mm -hmm. uh, going back to the history of biology. So, where does the prescription fit vis a vis the, the you know, because in, in, in popular medicine, street medicine, the pamphlet has played a very important role. I, we, we've seen these images you've seen in India too, people you know, putting plants on the road. So, this is my first question just to open the discussion. But those of you who are online, and I can see quite a few online, please type out your question. I'll be happy to read it out. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, yeah, I, I think it is, a, um, it's a really, it, it, I mean, it's a, it's a, a sort of core nub question that I'll have to grapple with, because in some senses, as you say, if the book is utterly then demediated, de de does, it, does it still remain a book? And one of the big challenges, I think, really in book history is to say, can we combine the inside and the outside of the book? You know, so traditional literary studies only looks at the inside. Most sort of book histories really only look at the outside. So can you sort of mediate between those two? Um, I mean, it's a bit of a, in, in the longer this, this uh, the insects and archives is, is extracted from a longer version, and there I sort of try to deal with that by um, looking then at uh, sort of literary representations of insects, but I mean, that doesn't really sort of, you know, kind of cut ice with the sort of question that, 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 that you're demanding. So I think it might be, you, one, one interesting route to go is there's a lot of book art which does this which sort of demediates the text because, you know, it's there's you can see it's a book, but you can't read it. Um, you know, so I think that might be quite an interesting sort of productive um, route, 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 route to go. Okay, I'm gonna uh, open op open the floor. Uh, any, yeah, Ravi, Ravi was there. Absolutely fascinating and marvelous today. I was trying to, uh, Work it through into uh, something which you are a well established practitioner and have a, lo a long history of dealing with. But uh, the longer kind of uh, pattern of methodologies in relationship to book history and how all these kind of spaces, figures, etc., have been there before the customs officer or the, uh, the uh, figure of censorship, the shipping line, uh, and other uh, figures of the book trade, and how that as an object it may move from site to, to site. Huh? Now here, I mean, to follow the logic of the earlier uh, earlier argument, if it's, what is it uh, to remediate the demediated? That would be one other way of uh, posing this because that would reconnect it with the longer history of uh, book, uh, book history studies. Because at some point the reader is a consequential entity. Here we are actually kind of uh, looking at something deconstructed into its materiality and not necessarily by humans, but by others. Huh? And uh, it, it fra it's framed within a kind of colonial plot, as it were. Uh, so what would this thing, because now atmospherics, now the actual kind of the form, not only of paper, but also of the inc encrustation of paper has actually been uh, put together in this. And yet, where does the space of the reader lie? Is that still an interesting question to <laughs> hold on to in this formulation? Thank you, Jan. I mean, as you say, it is, 
think that the question of the, the the question of the reader, as you say, is is sort of fairly absent in this paper, and you know needs to uh, be thought through much more. I, I I think partly it's the idea of the reader is also tied up with the fate of many sort of archives in the global south, where the archive you know becomes something very different from what the sort of normal expectation is. So, you know, in a lot of African archives, the job of the archivist is to keep people out, you know, because for all sorts of reasons, but partly you don't want somebody coming in for uncovering dirt on the current people in power, you know. So, and then, then of course, there is also, there's no electricity, no air conditioning. So there is this. So, so I suppose it would be a really interesting thing of the really sort of determined reader, you know, because very often in these sort of archive situations, you have to be extremely determined. Um, and so I suppose that would be, and then you would also read despite sections of the book being missing, you know, and then you, you, you sort of work with the partial bits that you have. Um, so I suppose that, you know, yeah, I thought you were <laughs> Um, in fact, I was very, you know, I, the, the one I reread for this sort of thinking about archives, the Carolyn Steedman piece on what it's called, she had a fever or something, you know, Michelet and Derrida and dust. And it's a, it's really interesting. It was produced, I see, in 2001, but it's a highly, highly material reading of archives in opposition to Derrida's, of course, much more abstract idea of the archive as what the fever of origins, you know, the endless fever of origins. And so, um, and she makes this really interesting point also that how uh, she's interested in the book also as a locus of poisons. Um, and she looks then at book binding practices and how, um, you know, a lot of poisons, in fact, um, you know, even like bits of anthrax could have made its way into the archive. And she, there's a, there, she, I, I don't know this, but she said Michelet, there, there's a poss possibility that he actually was killed by anthrax. <laughs> you know, so again, it's a, it's a, a kind of highly de dedicated, sacrificial reader, um, you know. And I suppose also increasingly, you know, as um, you know, machine production of texts takes over. You know, working in the archive is still a bit like, you know, you're training people for hand weaving on the eve of the Industrial Revolution. Um, you know, this kind of painful artisanal production of text, um, you know, when everything's about to change so dramatically. Um, so I think it is something, it's about the faithful reader, it's the, 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 the kind of dogged reader, the sacrificial reader, the, you know, all of, I think that sort of idea might be quite useful to, 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 to develop. Yes, there we go. Uh, wonderful uh, talk, uh, Professor Hoffner. Uh, my question is about, you know, uh, non-chemical, ways and living with insects as it as they live with the books and magazines i've, I've been to in, in 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 my trips of collecting magazines i've seen people who of course uh, they moisture invariably in the almiras and uh, then they periodically at least twice a year they would take them out in the sun to dry them up and uh, you know and one library I went to, there was no light at all. So I, I climbed up a chair and I, you know, uh, put on a bulb. Uh, they said, and, and so that one could read there. You see, there was no light. So, so of course, it is driven by so many lacks, as it were, uh, including lack of care for readers. So, but, you know, the, the books are in a permanent sta stage, state of decay. And so uh, the insects are having a field day, so it's a it's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful world in a way uh, uh, for to study, and uh, uh, lots of design artworks are created by the insects uh, as you leave through the books. Uh, it's a, if if one right were to just scan those pages, one could have a wonderful exhibition 
like the one you you mounted so i mean so uh, where you know these technologies are not really available or not being used uh, there are ways traditional ways right of driving killing whatever living with i don't know what to call it but these ways also exist in the south in india definitely yeah so slightly counter to ravikant's suggestion so ventilation is very central to one of the images that you showed which had the tamil thing at the bottom you know so the, after the gas is released then you must ventilate the room similarly sunlight and yet it seems to me that the only way in which you could officially describe an archive even in the global south is in this air conditioned country completely controlled environment so if you could say something about that transition that has happened for all its lack and for all the conditions under which actually existing archives work but the but the path has been set that you have to move in that direction uh, i had a slightly different question not related to book reading conditions which had to do with uh, this this phrase that he used biotic uh, nativism and the question that i have for you is how much of this continues to influence post colonial politics uh this is something uh, my reference comes from a recent book that a friend has done where in post colonial london the bird species that can exist there's a lot of this biotic nativism that goes on as to which bird species should be part of the you know city of london uh, so how much of this continues to be uh, of uh, influence okay. right thank you. Th thank you so much the um Somebody I, I, I read, um, also one of the pr preservation techniques or uh, prophylactic techniques in a way was to use neem leaves, um, which again is another lovely, you know, print uh, plant uh, relationship. But I think you're absolutely right that, I mean, there are long traditions, indigenous traditions of dealing with insects, um, you know, similarly in South Africa. Um, and so, you know, a lot of, and a lot of those obviously, you know, kind of get lost or, or, or kind of are not, not quite remembered. Um, but yeah, I think you are, you know, it, it, it is a really interesting question to both say, you know, well, what are those techniques? It, they will not always work, but then, as you say, you can do things with the damage, you know, it, 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 I suppose it is this, you know, this question about what can you do with forms of damage. There's quite an interesting, um, it, it, there's a lot of interest also in this idea of unmaking, you know, so if you, if you observe, um, you know, wood that has been eaten by termites has a sort of certain fascination because it's also about the unmaking, but it also has certain kinds of aesthetics. So, you know, it, it so, so much post-colonial reading is about sort of mourning, either mourning, witness, or melancholy. Um, and then I suppose it's a different tradition of thinking about um, as, what are the aesthetics of unmaking and what can you do with that? Um, if I can just tell you a wonderful quick story, which features in the longer version of this. Um, in the, it, around 1917, um, the, the Death Watch Beetle had made substantial damage to Westminster Hall, you know, which is part of the uh, parliamentary precinct in London. And they had a big fumigation exercise, and then they took out the, the old bits of wood and then offered these bits of woods to British museums and to the White Dominions, who gratefully received these toxic and worm-eaten pieces of wood. <laughs> But then what happened was that all the museums that took these things wrote back saying, everybody wants to know about the uh, about the insects. You know, can you tell us, can you send us pictures of the insects? Can you tell us about their life cycle? So in fact, it was, you know, sort of the, the, the insects that they'd become the protagonists of, 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 of the display. Um, um, okay. Um, 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 Oh, the, the question then of air conditioning and ventilation. Oh, I, I think there's a really, I mean, I haven't really looked, but I sort of don't know a lot about this, but my sense is it goes back to this idea of books in the tropics. 
And there was a whole science called tropical archivology, which was this idea that, you know, again, because of climatic conditions, you needed to train archivists in particular ways, you needed all the air conditioning. And I think it's very much a sort of nation building project, of probably then of the, you know, sort of late 40s, 50s and 60s. But I, I mean, I really haven't, uh, you know, followed it in, in, in any day detail, but there clearly was, you know, and there were all these kind of international and UN, UN specialists would come out and train people and, um, you know, so that would be an interesting story to follow. Um, yes, and, and, the, and the biological nativism, I mean, of course, is, is such an interesting thing because it is one of the sites in which all of those post-colonial, endless post-colonial debates about belonging and origin play out. Um, I, I don't know, um, I, I'm trying to think in, you know, South Africa currently is a highly xenophobic regime, um, but it it hasn't, it's sort of, whether it's how exactly it would play out in relation to plants, I'm not really sure. I mean, currently it's just, it's very much about still papers and documents, um, but it, 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 it would be, I mean, obviously a lot of the construction, particularly of the colonial state is around, you know, particular plant symbols, the protea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Uh, that's an enormous, uh, enormously promising area that you're opening up. I had um, uh, a question, uh, which is, um, you know, uh, you can have attacks of locusts on and, and who can ruin an entire crop. And um, in um, traditional practices, uh, you can have, uh, there are specialists uh, in India, they're known as Nath Yogis, who can actually, you know, counter uh, these attacks of, of, of locusts. Um, when it comes to disease in, in cattle and uh, in the area of Punjab, uh, you have low caste singers who can who perform, I suppose, perform a particular epic, Hiransha, and it is supposed to heal disease. So I'm thinking about uh, this question about of matter and spirit. And uh, even while your pre presentation is more, you know, it's more about the material and, but in the interstices, you know, I mean, I'm thinking of the visual of that man in the shop, you know, where, where everything's been bottled up, but clearly, you know, there's a range of knowledge, which is not only about, you know, sort of, poisons uh, of, of various kinds, but it's also about practitioners who are able to invoke spirits, you know, and, and connections uh, between different realms. So uh, I want to know a little bit more about the dynamic, um, you know, so indicated by hydrocolonialism or books in the biosphere. Yeah. Right, thank you. Thank, thank you so much. I I love those, absolutely those examples. You talk about that epic where a text is imagined to operate between this world and the next. You know, I think they're amazing forms of textuality, you know, that they can sort of cross these domains um, in very interesting sorts of ways. And um, yeah, so those, those, as you say, and also this idea that this text can cross domains to hear it is to be healed. It's an incredibly, you know, sort of interesting conceptualization of texts and, 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 and textuality. So that that idea of 
operating between worlds is very powerful in African notions of healing. Um, and so it is, again, very much this idea that, as I said, the healing agents are distributed um, in, in, in the same way that, you know, you, you get the text itself is distributed. It's kind of having its agencies and effects in many different domains. Um, so, so, so I think, I mean, that, that idea is absolutely central. And somebody like Norbor, his power would centrally be seen as his, his ability to speak to other worlds, um, you know, and to receive ancestral messages. Uh, dreams are particularly absolutely central in that whole sort of healing assemblage. Um, yeah, so that, that uh, you know, again, is, is, is utterly and, and completely central. And so it's a sort of interesting thing, really, again, that the plant also is drawn, is something that is seen to sort of operate in this distributed way and across worlds. You know, this lowly, it's a sort of little creeping plant. So it's very interesting to think about its capacities as being quite epic almost. We have one online question. First, we'll finish with the question from the room. Yeah. Thank you very much. You've raised so many intriguing questions, but I just want to pick up uh, the ones of uh, definitions that uh, you raise. And uh, it, it all goes back to the Doomsday Book in, in our British experience that uh, my history professor used to illustrate the Doomsday Book as a Franco Norman exercise in defining things comparable to the railway official who would have a, a, a board up the board of how much you had to pay to get to take something on a train. He said, horses is cows and cats is dogs. But this year, insect is a he was referring to a t turtle. This here turtle is an insect and don't need no ticket, you know. <laughs> so, so that kind of definition. But um, in relation to the book, I mean, we have many words for books um, before they became what we now call books, uh, scrolls and parchments and everything. And now we have books which have none of the characteristics of books at all. They have no paper, they have no cover, they have... Uh, they don't need an index. They have. They do, don't need pages because they're in Kindle or e-books. Are they still books? Um, thank you. Um, so, you know, so, so, so two things. I, I mean, I can see it's part. It's one of the sort of diseases of book history that you have this idea of the book, um, which you sort of use in a rather abstract kind of way. Um, and, and obviously the question is, you know, exactly what's many, many different kinds of books. And that's partly what that area of study does. Um, I think, I mean, I think there is still, you know, a book uh, because all of those debates on different kinds of media and technology always show, you know, that one medium is never sort of ex a kind of erased or expropriated by the other. So books always, I think, will find a niche I mean, I think they have, they, they've kind of sunk in value. You know, I can see that partly me making these artworks with books has to do with, you know, the fact that there are now so many books. Um, and, you know, they've, they've, you know they've, they, 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 they have lost value in that sense, so they can be recycled. Um, but I think, I mean, it is clear, you know, that books will, there, there will always be a niche for them. You know, so there were the debates about when, uh, television came in, everybody said, oh, it would erase cinema, but that actually didn't quite happen. Um, and there's always a sort of settling and, and uh, you know, the, the book finding a niche for itself. So I, I suspect that they will always, they, they, there is a book and they will always be here. Uh, help my, that, that was a wonderful talk. I just want to go back to an earlier moment of this discussion, <clears throat> the question of mediation and how mediation is one of the central axes through which you are discussing your project. This question of mediation is anchored in a certain form of materiality, isn't it? Materiality of the book and the way we perceive that materiality, the way we handle that materiality and so on and so forth. I was wondering, would you like to speculate 
on this question of book and biodiversity when this condition of materiality is changing which my previous speaker also mentioned briefly, this idea of a digitalized book culture, the e-book, increasingly we are reading on screen when there cannot be an insect inside the book, but there can be bugs which would uh, corrupt the device and so on. So would you like to speculate on this changing nature of materiality and how it affects the question of mediation and the larger problem you are addressing books and biodiversity. Okay. Uh, thank, thank you. I think um, the, the one, I, I would say, you know, in terms of what does this paper have to say to people who are interested in digital humanities, I would say it is, it would be a question of materiality as method. So, you know, to look then at the very material questions of how those digital products are produced. So I don't know, there's wonderful work by a scholar called Bonnie Mack, who looks at the digitization of mid, uh, medieval manuscripts, which are, of course, all produced in sort of sweatshops in Indonesia, I think. Um, and so, you know, it, it's, it's also so, so raising those sorts of material questions about where do these things come from and how are they made? Um, so I think that would be one carryover. Um, I think it is, I mean, it, it, it is then a very big question also of what it means for a changing idea of the archive because so many archives are now digital. And I think it goes back to this earlier discussion about the reader um, and whether in fact, you know, the, the old idea of the archive was very much a pilgrimage you know, to go and look at the actual, you know, the sort of glamour of the real thing. Um, and that no longer really operates. So, um, you know, whether the idea, in fact, that sort of art the idea of the artisanal reader, um, in fact, no longer really operates because you expect, you know, you don't expect to have to make all of these arrangements to get to see, get, 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 get to see these particular things. Um, you know, and they're much more readily available. So it could be, you know, produces a very different idea um, of what archival reading is. There is a question. Uh, so we have a question. Uh, uh, I, 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 she's anonymous and this asks, it says, I was curious of this outside and inside of the book and its circulation out across the non-human as a mediated object slash material. Would you find purchase in locating these movements performatively around across time? In that sense, uh, would it make the gaze on the object and its absent present traces of time allow for a historicization of the contemporary biosphere? It's a very dense question. <laughs> 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 so, curious. <laughs> okay, outside and inside, it's circulation across the non human. Translation in the cases, movements, performative. Okay, in that case, would it make a gaze on the object? It's absent present traces of time and also historicization of the contemporary biosphere. Okay, well, thank you. Th thank you very much. That's a very, very thought provoking question. I think I suppose that, you know, the, the one way to think about the, this question of the inside and the outside of the book is goes back to this debate on demediation. So, very often, you know, you can, books are used performatively only for their outside. You know, so the classic example of that is uh, people who perhaps are semi-literate, but where you know um, will carry newspapers and books. Um, so that's a performative use of the outside of the book, um, as opposed to the idea of any sort of detailed sort of engagement with the with with, with the inside of the book. Um, if you, I, th I think, if you're interested in this question, the really wonderful person to read is Leah Price. Um, 
who's a very, really a marvelous book historian, and she's got a book called How to Do Things with Books um, in Victorian Britain, I think it is. Um, and she makes this really interesting point that the inside of the book also has this kind of, I suppose, a sort of performative terror because we still believe that it is very virtuous to read the whole of a book. But in fact, very, very few forms of reading, apart perhaps from a gripping novel, involve complete reading. But one is still actually embarrassed to admit that one hasn't read the whole book. <laughs> and, you know, in academia, you know this. I mean, how many times have you pretended to read a whole book when you actually haven't done it? So I think, you know, there are all of these kinds of the inside and outside books exert kind of uh, put place performative demands upon us. Um, so I think that might be one way to think about the question. Thank you. I want to get back to one or two points that, that came up in the discussion. One of this 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 point uh, that you just, just just spoke about. So one of the big shifts with art, artificial intelligence, what is called artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. is large language models, is the synthesization of what we saw as the web universe. As when we search today, the search is synthesized. Uh, so Wikipedia okay. is summarized. So large language models synthesize our engagement with knowledge. You synthesize okay. it. You don't you don't actually go into Wikipedia. You see these little boxes. You don't navigate. So the idea of navigation, exactly like reading, has been synthesized for us because maybe it's this kind of secret urge of, you know, the shorthand has a history. So I think this, so the way navigation has also dramatically uh, transformed our encounter with print. It's a kind of print, it, 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 digital words. That's one. The other point, I think, which is very interesting, maybe you would develop it later on in your uh, work. Uh, UC Parika has this book, uh, Insect Media, yes, where yes. he takes this whole notion of distributed intelligence, uh, which, you know, forms of intelligence and insects use, uh, which, which, where, you know, where they, where they organize networks, the whole idea of the swarm. So you're the elements of that in, 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 in what you said today, but you're also still interested in the actual substrate, like your customs mm -hmm. inspector uh, in dog mm -hmm. sanity, you know, on the actual uh, form uh, this transmits mm -hmm. uh, and, and the way this also transmutes at some level and move, becomes something else, you know. Uh, so would you like so to comment on that? Okay. Um, I suppose again, just on the navigation, as you said, it it possibly it does, you know, you land, you know, it's a very different sort of idea of reading that you sort of land somewhere and you read that. But I always find this Leah Price's work extremely useful because she's very skeptical of this idea that, uh, you know, that actually technologies, new technologies change, you know, that 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 sort of argument. So she's she's very um, you know, she 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 believes this idea that actually, uh, it, it, you know, the thing new, newness is not so new. Um, and she makes the has got this wonderful book called Anth the Anthology and the Rise of the Novel, and shows the moment a major novel arrived, immediately there would be an anthology anthologization, absolutely almost like simultaneously, often almost before. And so that idea of reading in bits and pieces is deeply embedded, has been, you know, in the history of reading is a very old thing. So this idea of landing and reading a bit is also, you know, something that's been around for a long time. So I think that might be one way, one way to think about it. And the insect media, yes, of course, is, I mean, is is absolutely central in this idea of, um, you know, thinking about in the the. You know, insect organization as a kind of a as a infrastructure as a way of thinking as a all, all of those sorts of things and also the very interesting question he raises of media as insects you know so how if you reverse that how would that look um you know so if you think about the archives and the people running the archives as you know, to 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 what extent you know, is that media operating like insects? I think would be you know also a very productive and rich way to go. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is, I think, of all the Gangri lectures, I think what is remarkable about what you said today is I think it opens up and anticipates the coming two decades of scholarship. So thank you. Thank you once again for making the, the journey. And I hope you visit CSDS again. And thank you uh, for, for staying with us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.